absolutely, yeah. And now it's on to on to the next, so yeah. Could. And you, are you from London? No, no, we're from Kent. We travelled up from Kent. Down. And yeah. did you just come down especially for this? Yeah, just today. Yeah, just for this. She was, um, yeah, she wanted to, us to bring her up, so yeah, it was all all down to her. Oh, well, well done, Dolly. So thank Do you. you. Yeah. Doing the Queen proud. Thank Hello. You. Hello. Hello. What's your name? My name's Jess, and this is my friend Liv. Hello. Hello. Where have you come down from today? I'm from South East London. I'm from Essex. Essex. And why did you want to come down today? Oh, we've got to be part of history, haven't we? And as friends as well. We yeah. thought we could come down this year and, and, and now, and then in 30 years' time come back when it could be another big occasion with our children. It's part of history. We've got to be part of it. So. And it's kind of strange because we'll probably never see another Queen, will no. we? No. no, so that's why it was important. Yeah, well, it's was really it? important to us to pay our respect and do it for our grannies, grandparents and everything. So. Yeah, my nan. I lost my nan last year and she would have loved this, so I had to come down for her. And a lot of people have said the Queen reminded them of their mum or their granny, that generation that lovely world time generation I know, my Nenis we called her my grandma and she's got a picture with the Queen and it used to be front of stage in the house she loved the Queen so to be able to come down with some flowers, flowers today yeah. and pay our respects is yeah, so important and where's that photo now? Oh, I think my sister's got it, actually. My sister's got it up somewhere. It is somewhere. It's not in my house, unfortunately. It must be at her daughter's, my, my dad's sister. And are you hoping maybe to see King Charles today? Or... <gasps> Absolutely. He's yeah, here, isn't he? Yeah. I feel like we're just like really excited just to see like another monarch as well. It's a really sad occasion, but it's also really lovely for us to experience a king. Like We've never really experienced that, so it would be really nice. And not many people have experienced a coronation. No, not, no, many not at all. It's, it's new to most of us, isn't it? Completely. Absolutely, absolutely. So, and, yeah, we just want to be part of it, and I feel like that's the most what we're here yeah. for. We've got to make the most of it and pay our respect. She she done us proud for the, my whole life, your whole life. Exactly. Everyone's whole life, pretty much. So, yeah, it's really, it's really nice We're already to planning everyone. as well, aren't we? Monday, we're yeah. going to come down for the funeral. We think, yeah, yeah, we? yeah we've got to. We've got to be part of it. Come down nice and early. We've got to get our, try and get our spots, yeah. haven't we? Down yeah. this way. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you. Lovely Thank to you. meet you. Lovely to meet you, Thank you. too. And you can tell, Jane, how much the Queen meant to... Every generation here, you've got people, you know, that are just five years old, you've got people in their 70s, even 80s coming down. And the Queen and the royal family mean something different to a lot of them. But what a lot of people have been telling me is that she symbolised that unity and also stability. And some people are saying they felt quite unnerved when they heard that Queen Elizabeth had died. But now they really, really want to welcome King Charles to this role while he's mourning as well, he's mourning his mother and they want to make him feel incredibly welcome. Charlotte, super, thank you so much. We'll have more from you a little bit later. Charlotte Gallagher there at Buckingham Palace, a real, really fantastic flavour of... Jane, Jane, I think we'd better go home and just yeah. leave the people <laughs> outside Buckingham <It> Palace. <laughs> To put it all into words, it's so moving. It does feel and like so that, wise. doesn't it? It's so lovely. It's so it, yes, and children, as ever, often come out with the with with the best the best observations as well. Uh, we will have much more from there, of course. So the coffin, the Queen's coffin, still there on uh, in the cortege. Uh, through Perth, um, around about 35 miles to go, I believe, I'm just told, to Edinburgh, um, a little bit further to go. Uh, we're reflecting on its journey throughout. We've been talking about the number of people who've come out, who've lined very many parts of the, ro of the route. Um, let's just return to a scene we saw just a little bit earlier in the day, uh, not something we quite spotted at the time. But tractors in Aberdeenshire is as much as I can tell you, but it was a, they formed their own guard of honour. Let's just see this for the first time. That's a group of farmers who came out in a kind of coordinated uh, display um, just, I think, near to Bankery. Right, so relatively near... Much earlier this morning, maybe. Um, yeah. 
something mm -hmm. we didn't quite spot at the time, but that's somebody's rather been, lovely. Somebody's been in touch with me about that, actually. Hats off to the Aberdeenshire farmers for the show of respect as the Queen's funeral cortege passed from Balmoral to Aberdeen. These images are between Bankery and Aberdeen City, an area of Scotland that she and her family loved so dearly. Well done to every farmer. Yeah, yeah. Oh, lovely. Lovely and an unusual sight, but again, quite touching that they coordinated that, mm. as you say, and, and lined up. Um, and and, and uh, Princess Anne, of course, is in this car we're looking at. Yes, she indeed. She's experiencing with her husband. it all, yes. um, with her husband, Commander Tim Lawrence. She will have seen that, as she will see the crowds that have turned out and is yet to see what looks like a considerable, very, very substantial crowds uh, lining many of the streets in Edinburgh. That is yet to come. And Edinburgh preparing for its key role in all of this because once the cortege arrives, as we've been saying, that was due at four o'clock. We think it's running a little bit late, but once the cortege arrives, uh, there is much more ceremony besides in Edinburgh, in Scotland's capital. And that, as we've been saying, is the first place, the first part of the UK where members of the public will be able to pay their respects at a period of lying at rest. So Edinburgh preparing for all of that and its role. Judith Moritz is in the city and has been talking to people getting ready for those events. The Queen loved Balmoral above everywhere else. And so, as she left her summer home for the last time, a nod to that affection, the wreath atop the coffin created from some of her favourite flowers from the estate. The cortege is now making its way along a 175-mile route through the villages, towns and cities of eastern Scotland. And her subjects came out to sea. Here in Ballater, the community closest to Balmoral, where the Queen was considered a local by many. The coffin is being driven to Edinburgh and the city stands ready. This afternoon, a display of perfect pageantry, the public proclamation of the new King and a 21-gun salute at Edinburgh Castle. Those with ceremonial responsibilities are feeling a mixture of pressure and pride. It's a huge responsibility. I have been the Lord Provost and the Lord Lieutenant for just a few weeks, and I just hope I live up to the expectations of me, and I hope and I'm sure that the city will put on a, a very determined show of its respect for the Queen in the next few days. Because the Queen died at Balmoral, it set in train a whole sequence of events in Scotland that wouldn't have happened had she passed away in London. And so its capital city is readying itself as the Queen's coffin is brought here and Edinburgh becomes the centre of events for the next few days. On Monday, the King will join the procession as the coffin is brought along the Royal Mile to St Giles Cathedral, where the Queen will lie at rest. Anybody can talk about faith, but to live it is what makes a difference to people. And I think she lived it, and she lived it in the week. Reverend Liz Henderson is one of the royal chaplains and is preparing for the service of prayer and reflection to be held at the cathedral. When you look around Edinburgh, you can see that building, can't you? The, the place is getting busier and busier, and there are more and people gathering, and they are particularly in this part of the old town. And so the focus is very much on St Giles. It has particular significance um, for this service because the Queen actually came here just three weeks after her coronation in June 1953. And it was here that she was blessed by the then moderator of the Church of Scotland and the Dean of the Chapel Royal. Amongst the pomp and protocol, there are the people, once the Queen's subjects, now the King's, all witnessing history as it happens around them. Judith Moritz, BBC News, Edinburgh. And that's a flavour of the planning, and this is Edinburgh this afternoon. Quarter past three on a Sunday afternoon. 
thousands and thousands of people lining the streets of Scotland's capital, waiting for their chance to see the Queen's coffin pass by. We are keeping an eye on all of that and, uh, as I say, was due to arrive at about four o'clock in Edinburgh, but we're told that's still running a little late. But the crowds have been there for many, many hours. Our correspondents telling us that a lot of people started queuing really quite early this morning, so a little longer wait for them. I don't think people are going to mind. Those are just some of the scenes that we can bring you this afternoon from Edinburgh as the Queen makes her final journey from Balmoral to Edinburgh, where she will rest for 24 hours or so, and members of the public will be able to queue and pay their respects. As we stay with these images from the helicopter, let's talk as well to... I apologise, I will explain in a moment who I'm going to talk to, because we're just going to revert, we're just going to pivot to back to the capital, here we are at Buckingham Palace, back there again. Um, we've been talking a lot, haven't we, and heard some lovely, lovely stories and uh, thoughts and memories and anecdotes from members of the public who have been out there outside the railings of the palace. And we've heard a lot of cheering as the new King Charles was driven into the palace a little earlier. And I think that uh, what we're seeing right now, apologies, slightly blurry shot, but you'll appreciate very busy day with an awful lot of cameras and radio signals around. Um, this, I believe, is the Queen Consort just leaving the palace. She went in um, an hour or two ago. I slightly lose track of time now, but uh, there were big cheers, certainly, as she was driven slowly into the palace and now um, off to other areas. Uh, the new king, of course, we know, has a very busy afternoon of lots of meetings uh, with particular reference to the Commonwealth. He's got a lot of meetings with high commissioners, uh, with the Secretary General of the Commonwealth, and he has a number of uh, meetings with religious leaders as well. So uh, King Charles very much working away there this Sunday afternoon inside Buckingham Palace. Uh, we'll stay, uh, I think, with this shot for a while. We were just going to get the thoughts of my colleague, our security correspondent, Frank Gardner, because, Frank, you met the Queen on quite a few occasions, actually, including being presented with your OBE by the Queen. Yeah, that's right. I mean, absolute honour. Before I talk about that, I should just mention, I think uh, Tim Lawrence, Princess Anne's husband, was referred to earlier as a commander. He's actually a vice admiral, a three-star, which is two ranks above that. Oh, goodness. We um, don't want to demote anyone. We certainly don't. No. I don't think he deserves it. Um, the the thing that really has struck me over the years, um, in the many occasions I've been lucky enough to meet the Queen, was um, the extraordinary attention she pays to what people are saying. She's not going, she didn't go through the motions. She was genuinely interested in what people had to say. She'd look you in the eye, she'd, she'd pause, she'd listen, she'd respond. You know, th these weren't just sort of platitudes. She was so interested. When you think about the thousands of people that she met, and she was terribly kind to me when I got my OB. I was, um, I'd been shot the year before, so I was standing up with this Zimmer frame and the courtiers were very nervous because I think they thought I, there was a risk I might sort of topple over and fall on top of her or something. And um, she inquired about the nature of my injuries and she said, how very gallant of you to stand up, you know, which is really, really lovely. And some years later, um, at a charity event, which I was uh, uh, involved in, she was a patron of motability operations, and um, I mentioned to her that she gave me my OBE exactly 50 years after she gave my grandfather his OBE for, mine was for services to journalism, his was for services to forestry. But I said, think of that, 50 years apart, same sovereign. And she said, ha, huh, tell me about it, <laughs> which I think is rather lovely. And just in case lovely. anybody <laughs> thinks that this is sort of a case of less majeste, the palace cleared this, this anecdote and others. Um, and another one which I thought was terribly touching, um, we were discussing the Middle East and she loved um, meeting royals and others from the Middle East and she said, I, she was referring to the previous Sultan of Oman, at the time Sultan Qaboos was on the throne, but she said, I rather like the previous Sultan, but perhaps he just grew out of touch with his people and got deposed by his son 
perhaps it'll happen to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, she had that wonderful twinkle in her eye. You know, she could be serious when she needed to be and humorous when she wanted to be. She always got the occasion right in that sense. But actually, talking about eyes, um, she was Colonel-in-Chief of the Royal Green Jackets, which I was a, a serving officer as a territorial. And that was, they were disbanded, well, not disbanded, they were merged into the rifles in 2007. So there was a kind of cocktail party at St. James's Palace to mark this occasion. And she attended, she had something terribly wrong with her eye. Um, it was some kind of infection or whatever, but her absolute lack of vanity made her turn up. Um, I mean, she was clearly in some discomfort from this, mm. um, but she wanted to be there. Um, she, you know, she was a fantastic colonel and chief. She handed over uh, to her husband. So Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, was then colonel chief of the rifles. Uh, and currently it has been Camilla, now the queen consort. Um, so whether that will, I mean, she's, I suspect, going to be very busy, busier yes. than she has been. Um, but she has been a wonderful colonel in chief as was the Queen. And I just thought that was, you know, a vainer person would have said, I can't go out looking like looking this. Looking like this, yes. And yes. she obviously decided this was her duty. It was this overriding sense of duty that she had. It's lovely that you talk about the humour because we've touched on that a little today, but, but perhaps obviously under, under the circumstances today, not, not as much as we, as we might wish or like or would be appropriate. But that 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 glint was there, uh, and 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 we forget that that, that it was the, the as you say it was the right approach at the right time, and then yes the number of people she would have had to meet and yet she I suppose it's the, the best politicians they say have that as well that ability to make you feel as if you are the only person in the room that, at that moment and they are completely focused on that conversation with you. So that's what I'm sensing from you, is that that's what the experience, that's what the conversation was like. Yes, I mean, I'm lucky enough to have met her seven times and each time, the scariest thing about it, the only scary thing, is all the sort of protocol around it, the people around it. When you actually cut through and meet her face to face, she immediately put you at ease, um, you know, because she was so natural. Um, whereas there's natural, um, whereas there's an awful lot of pomp and ceremony and protocol and, you know, um, you, you, do, you do do this, you don't do that. But once you meet her, all of that melts away. So lovely to, uh, to hear those anecdotes. Frank, thank you very much uh, for now. Uh, Frank Gardner, thank you very much. Uh, we are just going to take a minute, as we promised much earlier in the day, we would just reflect the Queen's love of racing, uh, hugely knowledgeable about racing, of course, wasn't she? Uh, we're just going to talk a little about the St Ledger. It's the final classic of horse racing's flat season. It's due to begin in Doncaster. Uh, the Queen, well, almost doesn't need saying, does it? It is well documented, her love and knowledge in this uh, field. Uh, let's head there and join um, our correspondent, Matt Graveling, who is there at the winner's enclosure, in fact, at Doncaster Racecourse, where I imagine, Matt, the Queen is very much in people's thoughts. Oh, of course, Jane. In everybody's thought today in the St. Ledger, is going to be happening in around half an hour's time. But today really is a day where everybody connected with the Queen's most beloved sport of horse racing has come together. Of course, it was halted on Thursday when we heard about Her Majesty's poor health. But it is back today. There's racing. There's a seven-card race down in Chepstow. And here in Doncaster, well, flags are flying at half-mast. And there are books of remembrance for people to sign inside of the building. And the jockeys are all wearing black armbands in their races as well. And I can tell you that earlier, around 12.15 in the afternoon, here at the winner's enclosure, the staff and the jockeys, they all stood in a line and they first watch a three minute video of the Queen's history with horses. But then after that, they took two minutes to think of their own memories of the Queen. They paid their respect, heads were bowed. And then following that, the jockeys and the staff, along with 10,000 people who are here today, they all sung the national anthem with, of course, those new words of God save the king. Now, the Queen's love of horses, as you say, Jane, has been well documented. And in fact, in today's race program, there's a lovely black and white picture of Her Majesty on the front cover. And inside it says she first sat on a horse at the age of three, but then later in life, she became a very successful owner and breeder. 
and the jockeys who rode for the Queen, of course, won, uh, wore that lovely scarlet, purple and gold um, racing silks. And one of those who was lucky enough to be in the saddle for the Queen on many occasions was Frankie Dottori. He won the first race here today. A little bit earlier, I caught up with him and asked him for his favourite memory of the Queen. When I won my fourth King George, uh, I went up to the podium to get a trophy and uh, and she's asked me, asked me about the race and I explained to her how it all went and then uh, cheeky of me, I said, oh, by the way, uh, Your Majesty, I won it four times. And she turned around, she said, well, Leicester won it seven, <laughs> kind of, get back in your box. So she had that great sense of humour and, uh, you know, I, I met her no walks of life, uh, obviously Windsor Castle, Buckingham Palace, racing in my stable, in uh, other events. So, uh, yes, she was, uh, uh, you know, she always made a detour if somebody in the room was from racing because she felt more comfortable to talk to people of, of my sport that, you know, people that perhaps she didn't know. So uh, she had the special uh, attraction for racing and, uh, and that's why we love her so much. We lost our greatest ambassador. And that really is a sentiment that has been shared throughout the morning and throughout the day here at Doncaster. A little bit earlier, I spoke to Julie Harrington from the British Horse Racing Authority, and she said what the Queen did for the sport really is immeasurable. Now, of course, the Queen's most famous one win came in 2013 at the Gold Club with her horse estimate. But perhaps it's slightly fitting that racing returns here at Doncaster today and the St. Ledger will be taking place in about 25 minutes because of course that is a race the Queen won herself with her horse Dunfermline in 1977. And that of course was her Jubilee year as well. So a fantastic atmosphere here today. And do you know what else as well, Jane? Final thought for you. Frankie de Tory is also going to be riding in the St. Ledger, and although he's not the favourite as one of the Queen's jockeys on a day like today, you never know. Matt, thank you so much. Matt Graveling there at the St. Ledger in Doncaster. And we are, of course, keeping an eye on the cortege as it makes its way south to Edinburgh, but as we continue to watch these pictures. Uh, in terms of other formalities happening today, uh, you may know, if you were with us a little earlier, that the accession of the king has been proclaimed across all four of the UK's nations today. To call to his mercy our late sovereign lady Queen Elizabeth II, of blessed and glorious memory, by whose decease the crown of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland is solely and rightfully come to the Prince Charles Philip Arthur George. Well, let's go, as you can see, to our Ireland correspondent, Emma Vardy, who is at Royal Hillsborough near Belfast for more on all of today's uh, formalities and pageants and perhaps more besides there. Emma. Well, as Northern Ireland's Royal Accession Proclamation took place earlier today, there was a parade uh, by, with soldiers of the Royal Irish Regiment and the band of the Royal Irish Regiment were here too. And also members of the public have been braving some pretty heavy rain to be here too. They're still coming in this afternoon to lay flowers and that carpet of flowers at the gates of Hillsborough behind me has just been growing really over the last few days. Um, of course, political leaders have been attending the events too, although there was an announcement today 
from Sinn Féin and from the SDLP, the the two biggest nationalist parties here in Northern Ireland, that they wouldn't be attending the proclamation today. And that really comes down to the basic politics of Northern Ireland, really, and that nationalist parties here, of course, don't see uh, the royal family as their monarchy. Their aspirations are for uh, Northern Ireland to become part of a united Ireland with the Republic of Ireland in future. But of course, they also respect and um, appreciate the role that the Queen herself played in reconciliation and in relationship building uh, between the British and Irish relationship here. And Sinn Féin have said that they saw today's formalities as being for those who who see themselves as their political allegiance, as being to the Crown, but that they will be attending other events in the days to come. And of course, the King will be visiting here in Northern Ireland on Tuesday, uh, and they will be attending events to mark his arrival here then. Emma, thank you very much. Emma Vardy, our Ireland correspondent and our security correspondent, Frank Gardner, is still with me here in the studio. Um, and I should say, talking to you, Frank, not really in that role as, your, your, as a correspondent, <laughs> but simply because you have met the Queen on quite a few occasions. And some of that is because of your military connections. And, and, and I was just interested because earlier you mentioned that, you know, that the role of the monarchy is, is so important. And, and some people watching might think that it's uh, just ceremonial, if you like, the, the, the various roles they have within Britain's military. I mean, explain from your perspective what, how important that role was, what, what, what the Queen brought to that. Her role was hugely important. She's head of the armed forces, was head of the armed forces. She was colonel-in-chief, uh, or at least held a, a rank with over 50 military organisations, not just in Britain, but in the, around the Commonwealth. Amazingly, she had her first role as Colonel in Chief in 1947, when she became, when she was still Princess Elizabeth back then, she became Colonel in Chief of the Balaclava Company of the Royal Regiment of Scotland, or its equivalent back then. Um, she was Colonel in Chief of the Royal Green Jackets, which I was a serving member of uh, before it was amalgamated into the Rifles. And I remember being told on one of my very early mess evenings, like these mess dinners, um, we don't do the loyal toast. And I say, oh, really, why not? Because our loyalty to the Queen is never in doubt. Now, <laughs> that was actually a lot of nonsense because I attended plenty of loyal toasts. Um, but it was a nice idea. Um, and, of course, she was a superb horsewoman. You would see yes. her, a trooping, trooping the colour. Um, she would attend things like Sovereign's Parade. But, you know, when she was on horseback, she was completely at ease. She rode a lot, and there was famously that picture of her riding in the grounds of Windsor Castle, I think it was, with Ronald, President Ronald Reagan. Um, yes. Totally at ease, passionate about horses. Yes. Um, but her connections to the military were hugely valued by the military, and that's passed on, it's extended to other members of the family. So the military patronages are very important. They present colours. And in more recent years, when men and women have come back from operations in places like Iraq and Afghanistan, in some cases, young men and women uh, hardly into their 20s, with broken bodies having suffered terrible, life-changing, catastrophic injuries. The, the comfort that the Queen and other members of the royal family, and as I mentioned, Camilla, the, the, the Queen Consort, has been Colonel-in-Chief of the Rifles. This is, this is enormously comforting to people, to know that somebody as high up in such an exalted position in British society actually cares about them and wants to know about them and how they're getting on and what sort of what kind of pastoral care they're getting. These things really matter to people. So it's valued. Very, very interesting. Thank you so much. Uh, good to see you, Frank Gardner, with your uh, many recollections of meeting the Queen, in fact. Uh, we are going to return right now to Edinburgh because that, as we say, is where the cortege is headed. Uh, and uh, we've seen the crowds, haven't we, build and build on the Royal Mile. Let's cross over there now and join our Scotland correspondent, Alexandra McKenzie, uh, who I think, oh, near, near St Giles Cathedral, clearly. Um, Alexandra, hello. 
Hello, yes, just outside, um, yes, St Giles Cathedral here. And Edinburgh has been very much a focal point since Thursday night, but even more so today. The crowds have been gathering here all day with many people just wanting to come and catch a glimpse of the hearse. As it passes through here, as you said, yes, the end of its journey, which began much earlier this morning on Royal D side and then came through Aberdeen, Dundee and will finally end up here on the Royal Mile where people are packed into the streets all the way from the top of the Royal Mile up at the castle all the way down here past St Giles Cathedral and then eventually down to the Palace of Holyrood House. Now the coffin will come through in the in the hearse it will come over the new Queen's Ferry Crossing which was opened by the Queen a few uh, years ago and then will come into Edinburgh and skirt round the castle at the top of the mile and then will come down the Royal Mile to be seen by all the people waiting here. Some of them have been here uh, for hours, have been here for much of the day and down past St Giles where the service will be tomorrow and then down to the Palace of Holyrood House where the coffin will lie overnight before tomorrow uh, there will be a procession tomorrow joined by members of the royal family the procession will come back up the Royal Mile to St Giles Cathedral where they are preparing there for that service tomorrow and then there will be a vigil in the evening with members of the royal family and the coffin will lay there at rest for 24 hours so that members of the public can come and pay their respects to the late Queen and many people here and that's all they've known they've just known one monarch uh, Queen Elizabeth um, for the 70 years that she was on the throne and this wasn't the the only thing happening here in Edinburgh earlier today there were two proclamations one announcing the new King King Charles III to the people of Scotland that took place at the Market Cross which is just at the other side of St Giles and people gathered here for that there was a procession down from the castle that was attended by many dignitaries and politicians Nicola Sturgeon and leaders of other political parties and then there was a second proclamation that was up at Edinburgh Castle and that was to announce the new king to the people of Edinburgh and people have been coming to Edinburgh um, since Thursday night um, Holyrood Palace that has been a focal point up till now many people coming to lay flowers tributes candles messages some just saying a simple thank you and you know people have been showing emotion and you know just expressing their loss people just wanting to come together many people just you know standing in silence just coming to want to come together and remember the late queen alexandra mckenzie thank you so much there uh, in edinburgh as we return to the images we've been looking at of the cortege, which I am told is now actually not far from the Queen's Free Crossing. Uh, would it be fair to? Oh, I, well, I've just, <laughs> I don't even have. I haven't even got the sentence out. I was about to say, would yeah. it be fair to assume, Martin, that we will um, have uh, considerable crowds at this yeah, point? But a, uh, that bridge was that bridge was pretty full. That's Dunfermline. It's the Dunfermline turn off on the N90 motorway. Um, ancient borough of Dunfermline, a thousand years old, but was made a city in the um, Platinum Jubilee celebrations. But yes, as you can see, it's, um, I mean, that bridge was, there was, there was no room to stand hardly on that bridge now. So I think that's a, a, a portent of what's going to, what we're going to see in, in Edinburgh. Um, these people obviously have uh, had a chance to watch what's been happening over the course of the day and plan their day and perhaps people who didn't necessarily know the route or know this was happening of uh, change plans and are coming out. That's that's Rosyth. If the picture sharpens up, that's the town of Rosyth. And in the distance, you can see the naval dockyard of Rosyth, where the Queen 
uh, named the, um, the Britain's biggest battleship and, and named in her honour the HMS Queen Elizabeth. Um, I think she named it quite a while back actually, but it was uh, it was launched into service in well, it, was, it began service in 2020. It's the biggest, it's the flagship of the naval fleet. And there you can see, if the picture sharpens up again, the three fourth bridges, the, the rail bridge on the left, the darker bridge, uh, and in the middle, the old fourth road bridge, which is still in use for kind of buses and public transport. But the Queen opened that in 1964. And on the right, the bridge that she's about to cross, the Queensferry Crossing, which she opened in 2017, a really elegant and dramatic piece of uh, engineering. It's very, be very beautiful, isn't it? It's an only 2017, it's not, yeah, it's still 2017, not yeah. that long. And periodically, as you see, the cameras um, switch back as well to the various vantage points that we have in Edinburgh because uh, we talk about the Royal Mile a lot. It's, it's very famous. It's a well-known in terms of tourism as well. Uh, but there are many, many other streets, not just the Royal Mile that we are focused on. And there's many streets that are really filling up, have been filling up over the course of the day. And uh, a huge turnout clearly there in Edinburgh. As I say, I'm afraid we don't have any official estimates. We don't have anything from the authorities as to, as to the numbers they think are out on the streets yet. But Edinburgh's part in this is huge, uh, as we've been reflecting. There's been a lot of preparation, a lot of build up. And Edinburgh will be the first place in the UK that members of the public are able to pay their very last respects as the Queen will lie at rest for a period. And Robert Lacey, you've been watching all of this throughout the day with us. And uh, you, you were explaining earlier that the, the, the notion that lying in state has, hasn't always happened. It's... Um, relatively new in, in historical terms. Yes, the, the, the first, um, the, the, as I was saying, the first lying estate we, we, we know of on a major scale was for, for Gladstone, the Prime Minister, um, and uh, at the end of Queen Victoria's reign, and uh, George V, who was the Queen's um, grandfather, uh, when, when he saw this event, um, he thought it would be a wonderful way to honour his own father, um, Edward the Seventh, the great grandfather of the Queen, and so that's when the institution started. And um, the lying in state was originally just um, f for a day or so. Now, um, for Elizabeth the Second, um, is going to be um, uh, what is it? A day, twenty-four hours I in Scotland, it's 24 hours, and yes. four days in four um, days in London. In London, I mean, I, I was reflecting on, on that. Um, wonderful sequence we saw about her love of racing. Um, I, I, I think uh, you know, one, one of the secrets of her, her success and her meaning to people was that while her job was grand, she was not grand. Um, she, I mean, it's a cliche to talk about the, 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 the common touch, but uh, she just had populist instincts in her. Um, and as we've said so many times, she was a player who understood she was in a system there look we're looking uh, the, 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 she was in a system that's that's more important than than any one individual and she worked so hard to to make the royal family operate as a team and at, as we were saying earlier too um king charles is clearly taking steps to imitate her very much in talking to william about um uh, the need for him to get together with Harry, as we saw yesterday. And uh, um, that's clearly um, King Charles hard at work following in the traditions of his mother. And he will have had a long, he has had a long time to think about what sort of monarch he wants to be, whether there will be a slightly different tone, whether it will be a more slimmed down monarchy. Mm. Um, some suggestions, even in the last 48 hours, that other historians, royal watchers making the point that they wonder whether this will be a slightly more emotional monarchy, and they mean that in a good way. Mm. The fact that he he and his wife, very, very early on, after the news was still very fresh, really, that the Queen had died, uh, was, was greeting people at Buckingham Palace, showing interest, saying, thank you for coming, thank you for laying flowers. Whether that was him instantly wanting to lay down a marker and say, this is the, the sort of king I want to be. Mm. Well, in view of the huge popularity of William and Catherine, um, 
there'd been a sort of tendency to say, well, Charles and Camilla, they'll be caretaker monarchs. Um, and maybe I myself was one who thought, well, they're interim for the real top of the pops. But in fact, in these last few days, we've seen extraordinary um, upwellings of, of sympathy, and, and, but also support and encouragement for Charles and Camilla. I mean, the polls are not out yet, but um, I think that that's a natural reaction to the situation. But the way in which King Charles has already um, reached out to people with two walkabouts, um, he's taken this private initiative to try and get his sons back together closer, certainly in public. Um, yes. These all show an activist king. Um, yes, he's had a long time to think about it, but he's jumped straight in, actually. And um, I think, you know, I, don't, I think it's fair enough to speculate the coronation is going to come much quicker than it did last time when we had to wait 18 months. Um, oh, that's interesting. You think it will because we, there's no, there's been no discussion of dates or anything, quite rightly. Well, it's, uh, I, but but um, I, I, I think but, maybe I, maybe some of us assumed that it would take a long time simply because. Well, that's it what took a long time, time in the. Old, it took the constitution. The coronation took a long time in 1952 to three, nearly 18 months, because they hadn't quite worked out the, the significance of television, and they had yes. to convert the abbey from a church holding 2,000 to sort of mini football stadium holding 8,000 because of the idea of the Queen being crowned in the sight of all the people. That was an enormous physical undertaking, which won't be necessary this time. And uh, there is this royal tradition, something also started by um, King Edward VII, the sort of populist king at the beginning of the 20th century, that royal events should take place in the summer. He was the first king who celebrated a winter birthday in the summer because it's better and more fun for everybody to celebrate in the summer. So I don't imagine we'll have a coronation this winter, but certainly um, I would have thought um, that uh, next summer is the latest one can expect for um, a coronation. But obviously the, the feelings associated with the the loss of the Queen and her funeral will have to be played through thoroughly before um, that can happen. Of course, oh, absolutely. And um, yes, apologies, slightly, uh, slightly running before we can walk in one sense. But it is uh, <clears throat> there is so much to, to, to cover and and so much to discuss. Uh, but our focus, I, we must keep pulling it back to this. Our focus is very much today on the cortege, the movement of the Queen's coffin from Balmoral down to Edinburgh. Apologies, just uh, occasionally losing the line there. But uh, the Queensferry crossing. And again, Martin, your thoughts about the sort of numbers of people that we are seeing and what we're, what we're witnessing here. Well, we're looking at the Dean Bridge in Edinburgh now, the end of Queensferry Street. And um, just People who know Edinburgh will know the west end of Princes Street, that part of town, the new town of Edinburgh. Uh, that's where that is. This is actually further down Queensferry Street. But we're, we're look, certainly at the Dean Bridge. It looked like the numbers were, were you know, they, they, were, they were very deep uh, on the pavements. And as we we saw from the aerial shots earlier on, when the convoy passed just over the Queensferry crossing, past the town of Queensferry itself, there was a bridge there and some embankments on the side of the motorway, and they're just packed with people, packed with people. Um, so, yeah, we, we shall see. They're, they're just about to head down towards Cramond. People who know Central Scotland will know that area. Um, and they'll be in town in about another mile or so, or on the edge of town. They'll be in right. urban, urban built-up Edinburgh, maybe a couple, two miles from here, say. Um, so, yeah, w we shall see. But everything that we've seen so far suggests this could be something quite spectacular. Queen's Ferry itself, named after Queen Margaret, Saint Margaret, Queen, the wife of Malcolm Canmore, a thousand years ago. And there's a chapel in Edinburgh Castle, the oldest building in the city of Edinburgh, Saint Margaret's Chapel. A uh, tiny, tiny little building where she used to pray uh, well over a thousand years ago now. And this will be, uh, as, it, as it gets into Edinburgh proper, the cortege, I feel as if this, this is going to be quite a moment, actually. The first time we will see that coffin travel through a, a much, much more densely populated area, a much more uh, tight -knit, um, tightly packed geographically area, I mean. Um, and again, it's the, 
when you catch that glimpse of exactly what we're looking at there, you look at the vehicle, you think that that is the Queen, that is the late Queen, and that is poignant and sobering. It, it is worth catching yourself and reminding yourself of that, isn't it? Because we've spent so long just looking at the journey of a car. It's the contents of that car in the front that, that really make this an extraordinary moment in history. And people are gathering with the conventions of a crowd, which are usually associated with celebration, mm. football matches, horse racing, whatever. Um, and uh, it's easier, really, for the folks down around Buckingham Palace, cheering the new, the new king and queen. Um, uh, complex emotions now. And uh, uh, it will be interesting to see how people... Uh, how the crowds react. There we see crowds and, and this, this, what we've come to see from the air, um, getting used to seeing the cars parked, people have got out and uh, gone to the side of the road um, to catch this glimpse, even though the, the cavalcade is, is streaking past them pretty rapidly at this stage. And as we stay with the aerial images that we are now familiar with today of the cortege, um, I I'm looking as well at a number of other camera angles that we have, of course, trained in various parts of Edinburgh. And I know we keep saying it, but uh, I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands of people out on the streets. And we know that many of them have been there since really quite early this morning. They've been standing there for many, many hours waiting for their glimpse of what we have been looking at here since 10 o'clock this morning. That was the point at which the Queen's cortege left Balmoral. Well, we'll stay with these pictures. Let's just try to give you a sense of uh, what we're witnessing here and, and uh, what is to come in the next few minutes and hours. This is the cortege taking the Queen to her resting place for tonight at Holyrood House in Edinburgh. It set off just after 10 o'clock this morning from Balmoral. And worth reminding you, perhaps, before we get into Edinburgh proper, of what we expect in the coming days. Tomorrow afternoon, Monday afternoon, there will be a short procession of the coffin along the Royal Mile to St Giles Cathedral with the King and Queen Consort following on foot. A service will then be held, attended by members of the royal family. The Queen will remain at St Giles for a short period of lying in rest. And then in the evening, there will be a vigil. Later, the Queen's coffin will be taken to Edinburgh Airport. That will happen on uh, Tuesday tea time. Her body will be flown to London. And she'll be accompanied by her daughter, by the Princess Royal, Princess Anne. And it will arrive at Buckingham Palace in the evening, witnessed by the new King, by King Charles and the Queen Consort. Then on Wednesday afternoon, the Queen's coffin will be adorned with the crown and a wreath of flowers. And it will travel on a gun carriage from Buckingham Palace to Westminster Hall. That is what awaits in the coming days. Our royal correspondent, Sean Coughlin, is, has joined us here in the studio. Uh, Sean, so what we are witnessing here as we look at these scenes in Edinburgh, everything we've been seeing over the course of the day, uh, we build up to a, a moment of reflection for the people of Edinburgh, many people from across Scotland now, and then we've just given a sense of what is to come in the days to come. So I suppose this first pausing point, if I can put it that way, is what we will see in the next 24 hours or so in, in Scotland's capital. These will be the first people who will have their chance to, to pay their respects and, and file past the Queen's coffin. That's absolutely right. In a way, this is almost like the first step 
in a journey that will take more than a week now, actually. This is the first from Balmoral to Edinburgh. Gradually, this rolls out. And I think this morning, I thought it was very moving that it began very simply in Balmoral, the Queen's coffin carried by six of her gamekeepers, people she knew and worked with, an oak coffin taken to the hearse, in a rather homely scene. That will then gradually play out in this great arc of the narrative until it reaches Westminster Abbey for the state funeral with you know, choirs, grandeur and world leaders in the pews. And this is today the first glimpse of that. And Edinburgh, when we've seen the route of the journey to Edinburgh, there have been small groups of people looking and, and wishing well in dotted groups. Edinburgh will be a bigger crowd. Eventually London will be an even bigger crowd. So I think this is gradually building up to a sort of crescendo uh, of, of movement and activity and eventually a very solemn conclusion. Yes, of course. Uh, and people watching, um, sombre and sober though this is, there, I mean, there will be people watching this thinking, I, I want my child, I want to queue. However long it takes, I want to queue. I want to have that moment mm. uh, for whatever reason. I want to file past the Queen's coffin, pay my that's respects. Right. Whatever their motivations might be, uh, whether that's in Edinburgh or London. Um, I mean, so, it's how, a moment how, of history, isn't it? I isn't think, it? You know, for all of us, none of us have seen this before, very few of us have seen this before. We don't know if we'll ever see it again. So I think there is an opportunity to, to you almost take part in it, to pay our own respects. But to see it, I think, is very important. Uh, and I think people often want to be there. We want to watch it on television as well. But I think, you know, lining the road, looking at something is something. It's a very deep tradition that happens, you know, each time these big events happen and people like to come and go. And even coming to work this morning, you could see people on the trains with bunches of flowers hoping to go to Buckingham Palace. And there's a sense of participation, I think, and anticipation as well as people are thinking what's happened. And I think you'll see it in communities across the country as this cortege goes through. Um, so I think we'll, we'll see more of this. And people will have their own thoughts. You know, as you say, people have their own reasons for being there and they'll bring their children and you know, and, and say, or perhaps older people will remember the coronation. And I think it's a, a generational thing too. People will want to talk about it, take pictures and remember it and talk about it, I think. It's, I think it's what people are now discussing and thinking about. Yes, yes. We'll go to Edinburgh in a moment. But Robert, yes, well, just your it's, thoughts it's on that. Yes. How, as you say, all, all these interviews we, we've had practically have been intergenerational. There have been grandmothers, yes. Yes. others, children. Um, it, it does bring people together um, in sadness, but also in a very human sense. And I love your analogy to it starting in this small way and, and swelling up and going through all those harvested fields of rural Scotland, um, moving now into the urban area and what lies ahead. It's, uh, it's like a it, river going from a stream to a river, isn't it? Exactly. It'll, it'll and, swell uh, and I mean, uh, and, uh, you know, royalty is about choreography um, and it's, Again, as we said so much, it's, it's something the Queen did very well. And the way he's started looks like Prince Charles is carrying on at, at speed. I think also, that, you know, Robert would know much more than I would, that, 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 that you know, the expression that monarchy has to be seen to be believed. Yes. And I think that's almost so true. That's also true in the sad parts of monarchy, too, isn't it? It's yes. The, the and the other, the other saying is monarchy is only as good as people doing the job. Well, she did the job, didn't she? And that's what people are marking today and will be in the week ahead. Well, and that is why we are seeing crowds in the numbers that we are, of course, isn't it? Let's return to Edinburgh and rejoin Sarah Smith, who is there for us throughout. And uh, we're looking at um, images from the sky that you perhaps uh, don't have access to, Sarah, but um, quite deep crowds of people as the cortege uh, skirts its way uh, gradually into Edinburgh. And so uh, huge crowds we're seeing, I think, is that fair to say, where you are? Oh yes, it's building all the time. Huge numbers of people who are now lining the Royal Mile, as you saw a few minutes ago, and all around here, around Holyrood House Palace as well. And what's interesting is, although there's a real sense of anticipation building here, as they expect the cortege to come through and be able to catch a glimpse of it, it's just how polite everybody is being. There are people here in such huge numbers, it would be easy to see some jostling and shoving as people try to get their best spot. But there's a real kind of family atmosphere here as you've got young babies, um, old people, dogs, you name it. Generations have come out and they're standing very patiently, very quietly, waiting for the cortege to arrive without any sense of selfishness, trying to grab their own spot. It's very, very friendly. And it's very, very 
somber. People are, you know, standing, reflecting on what's happened as they wait to see the cortege. And it's very different from other occasions when you might see huge crowds like this. And looking at the numbers of people lining the Royal Mile there, it got me thinking about other times we've seen huge crowds come out like this, uh, particularly along the Royal Mile in Edinburgh. The last time I can remember seeing anything like this was when the Scottish Parliament was being opened for the first time in 1999. There weren't quite so many people there then, but the whole of the Royal Mile was lined with well wishes when they saw Queen Elizabeth driving in an open-top vehicle up from Holyrood House all the way up the Royal Mile to the General Assembly building of the Church of Scotland to open the Scottish Parliament for the first time. That was, uh, that was people lining the streets of the Royal Mile in order to catch a glimpse of Queen Elizabeth and she came to Scotland very early in her reign. She made a real point of coming here just three weeks after the coronation in 1953 and again her and her husband the Duke of Edinburgh drove through the streets of Edinburgh in an open top vehicle so that people could see them. People were lining the Royal Mile then in order to say hello to their new Queen in 1953 and they've come out in even greater numbers in order to say goodbye to Queen Elizabeth in Edinburgh. When she opened the Scottish Parliament uh, in 1999, the Queen spoke very deliberately about the people of Scotland and she said, the grit, determination and humour, the forthrightness and above all the strong sense of identity of the Scottish people are qualities which contribute so much to the life of the United Kingdom. It was her paying tribute to, well as she said, the grit and determination of Scottish people and making clear she understood that this was a country within the United Kingdom with its own sense of identity and people of a distinct character. She knew them, she understood them, she cared deeply for Scotland and that'll be one of the reasons that we are seeing just so many people coming out to catch a glimpse of the coffin as it's driving through the streets of Edinburgh and making its way here to the historic old town right in the centre of Edinburgh where the cortege will finish its journey at the Palace of Holyrood House, which was, of course, always the Queen's official residence whenever she was in Scotland. Sarah Smith, thank you very much for now. Uh, Sarah, uh, they're um, keeping an eye as crowds build, continue to build there in Edinburgh as the cortege makes its way now into Scotland's capital. The BBC's Royal Correspondent Sean Coughlin is watching these pictures in the studio with me and still with us, the historian, royal historian and biographer Robert Lacey. And Robert, goodness, I, I've been, you and I have been following this journey all day from early this morning and there was that deeply poignant moment when the gates of Balmoral opened and the cortege started to make its way out and we saw the coffin for the first time. I feel as if this now, the entry into Edinburgh, is similarly moving. I'm not even sure whether I can put my finger on why. Something about uh, the capital, the sheer number of people there, um, the fact that the Queen will rest here now for 24 hours or so as well. There's something um, very simple but sad and poignant about that as well. I feel just the same actually. I was just about trying to work out, work out myself how to put it into words. Um, the first sight of her in the coffin was of course tremendously moving to everybody who saw it around the world on television. Then out on the road um, we got sucked up by the, the, the feelings of people along the way and uh, and also our excursions back to London where the mood is so different because it's looking to the future um, with, with, with King Charles. And now suddenly um, uh, we, f we sense, don't we, that um, there's the, the something emotional coming now and our focus is entirely back on this woman. Why everybody around the world, but here particularly in Scotland, the capital of Scotland, is, is, is so moved and wants to pay their particular tribute to, to what she's done and what she's meant to them. And again, it takes us back to much of what you and I talked about a lot over that long Platinum Jubilee weekend. Uh, the crowds we saw, the celebrations we saw, there will be, there were people you and I spoke to who might have had 
certain views on the monarchy, certainly might have wanted to see a, a more modernised monarchy, however you define that, but a, but a, a slimmed down monarchy, thought that there might be changes that could be made in 2022 to the institution. But that one theme that cut through Edinburgh everything. Edinburgh are gathering to mark now. Yes. And actually, Sean, ju I mean, just picking up briefly on uh, Robert's Ireland point, I mean, you think of those images today of the Queen shaking hands with some of those politicians. That's right, she that's right, I mean, yes. uh, images that a few years previously you couldn't have imagined mm. witnessing. And that, of, and that, yes, exactly. To Robert's point, that's, that's the, the role that, her, that, that she played in that. And it carries a great deal of symbolic weight, and the Queen brought with her uh, a sort of dignity, and, and also her separation from the, the party political process allowed her to be above that. And I think it was, you know, she brought a lot of dignity to those relationships. I think it was a very, you know, profound thing. Um, I think, I think, you know, and I think that's part of the fact that often part of her, the way she's held now is the fact we know so little about what she thinks about things as part of it. There's, you know, the, the mystery of, of, of yes. you know, behind the, the, the mask of duty. Um, we still don't know really. And I think that allowed many people to project many things on, onto her. Uh, and I think that's part of, it's a very hard thing to do and to sustain that. And as you say, never to put a foot wrong, never to, to, to you know, to, to, to step away from that. And I think as it, as that's an achievement in itself, I think, that, that people recognise. Wouldn't we love to know some of the things that <laughs> no, were said in those true. political and conversations also, in particular, but, but we won't. We won't. And also, I think it's the thing when you look at those pictures there, you have that great sense of, of ordinary places seeing extraordinary things. You know, when you see back gardens and... and shops and front, you know people going about and and then there's this cortege cortege going through i think there's something about that that's very moving just to seeing that that the, the sheer history going through your front door and people coming out to see it and they'll say they were there and remember it and, and i think that's it, it's ordinariness as part of it, it's extraordinariness i think you know that to see those scenes in those places i wonder whether we have any sound from any of our cameras there as the cortege makes its way through Edinburgh. Whether we just get a sense of what the crowd is or isn't saying, doing. Many, many people clapping as the cortege goes past, as we have seen in earlier stages of this journey. Beautiful aerial shots of Edinburgh. I think we will have other images of well as well of the Royal Mile. Very moving watching the cortege drive through those streets. And people who'd been waiting for so so long, just standing quietly, calmly, and then that lovely ripple of applause as the cortege passed them by as the Queen makes her final journey through her beloved Scotland. And the coffin will rest for 24 hours in St Giles Cathedral. And as we stay with these pictures, let's talk to the Right Reverend Dr Died. Ian at the Royal Deeside Estate. And thank you so much uh, for being with us here on the BBC as we stay with images from the city of Edinburgh and tell us about your, your final, as it turned out to be, conversation with Her Majesty. What's, what did you discuss? Well, it was uh, exactly a week ago today um, and we were just uh, discussing the service that had taken place at Crathy Church. We were doing that over dinner. Um, she was very lively and engaged in discussion. 
uh, and um, she, when she was, when I was giving leave to uh, leave um, Balmoral, uh, I spoke to her for a few moments and I gave her a wooden cross that had been made by uh, prisoners in Glenoghal prison. Uh, and she very gratefully received it from me and, and wished me goodbye. Uh, I, I find it very difficult to believe that that lady who was so uh, alive and uh, with it uh, a week ago is no longer with us. Because we had all seen her looking much more frail physically, but you are, well, you're clearly telling us that in every other way she was... Um, she was bright. She was she was engaged. She was was she the, the the person you had always known, the person you had always had these sort of conversations with. Well, I I mean I hadn't had any conversations with her up until then, uh, and I hadn't known what to expect. And uh, you're right, she was frail when she came into the room, uh, but that wasn't uh, the lady that I uh, was engaged in conversation with on Saturday or on Sunday. Uh, she was intelligent. She was with it, up to date. Uh, she had incredible memory for things. Uh, and I, I just find it very difficult to believe that that's her gone. And it is well documented, the importance of her faith to her throughout her life. Uh, did you did you touch on that? Yes, we did. And uh, that was very evident in the conversations that we had. And We'll have the opportunity now, uh, tomorrow, of expressing our thanksgiving for her life in St Giles, and it's a very appropriate place uh, that that will take place in, and it's very appropriate that we'll be celebrating her life and her faith there. And just on a, a, a more personal level, I suppose, I, I, again, I'm struck by the number of people over the last few days who who've said to me uh, how much the Queen would would put you at your ease when you entered the room, despite the inevitable formality surrounding her. I think everyone has said, once you are actually in her presence, she is, she was, uh, we forget that, she was uh, remarkably easy to talk to. Is it, it, Would you say that was your experience? Absolutely. She was the Queen, yes, you knew that. Uh, and uh, there was a certain respect for her. Her, Her Majesty, but absolutely uh, had you right at, at your ease from the get-go. She was quite a remarkable lady. Thank you so much for your remembrances and for your time here on BBC News. Thank you. That's right, Reverend Dr Ian Greenshields, the moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland. And now let's turn, return to the centre of Edinburgh. Well, I don't even know how many deep those crowds are. Just people, as far as the eye can see, as this cortege makes its slow final procession through the streets of Edinburgh. And the Queen's coffin will rest there in St Giles Cathedral for 24 hours. This is the capital of one of her kingdoms. To which she's returning for the last time. Um, and I think, I mean, it's always become a cliche, people saying, I'm here because of the history. But uh, why not? It, 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 it is an age passing. Um, and um, <clears throat> such, the, such a strange, sorry, such a shy, person, for such a shy person to command such uh, um, loyalty and love, um, well, it's actually a tribute to her shyness and, I think, to her Christian faith. I mean, um, it's not for him to say, but I'm sure she greatly had, had enjoyed meeting the Dr. Ian Greenshields. Um, her professional duties brought her up with a number of classes. Um, of, of, of men and women, men of politics, and men of philanthropy, men and women of philanthropy, and women of politics. But it was always said that she and the Duke of Edinburgh, who did enjoy a good 
philosophical argument, loved to talk with um, men and women of God um, and to discuss the faith that both of them, the personal faith that both of them had, and which we heard the new King Charles express so eloquently, talking about his mother and father now being joined in heaven. Let's just hear a little of the crowds again, shall we? Again, plenty of clapping. It's this slow procession makes its way. Uh, apologies, I'm slightly jumping ahead of myself because, of course, the cortege uh, is taking the Queen to the Palace of Holyrood House. Uh, that will be its final destination this afternoon. Uh, but, of course, ultimately, the Queen will lay at rest at St Giles Cathedral, the cathedral we've mentioned many times today, and that is where people will be able to pay their respects. But at the moment, the cortege wending its way to the palace of Holyrood House. That really was the Royal Mile today, wasn't it? In every sense. The Royal Mile in every sense. It is, isn't it? Yes. I think it's also interesting when you watch that, that people are clapping very politely, but it's like people will think, how do you respond to, to a funeral? People aren't going to cheer or shout, or, or but there's this a ripple of polite applause. There is, isn't there? Let's, want to reflect on that, let, let's hear a little more of that, I think.
And so the Queen is very nearly at the end of her journey for today. The hearse pulled up at the front of the Palace of Holyrood House in Edinburgh. And she will remain there overnight before the focus then tomorrow turns to St Giles Cathedral in the city. The coffin will be taken into the throne room inside Holyrood House. which will be her resting place for tonight. So quiet at Holyrood House. And my guests watching all of this today, this moment in history, as the Queen's coffin is taken inside. The Princess Royal, Princess Anne. Prince Andrew and Prince Edward. The Queen's children. So she now has three of her children with her and Prince Charles will, sorry, King Charles will come tomorrow. Yes, the Princess Royal and her husband made that journey with the cortege, staying with her mother throughout that final journey from Balmoral to Edinburgh. And now the Queen's three children there inside the palace of Holyrood House, where the Queen will rest tonight. And again, seeing her three children it reminds us perhaps of those scenes we saw less than 24 hours ago, I think, outside Balmoral as members of the royal family came out to thank the well-wishers, to look at the flowers, to read all the messages. And we saw those very, very moving images of some of the members of the royal family visibly upset. They had lost a loved one. So easy to forget that... Uh, Princess Beatrice and Eugenie, for example, who were very, very tearful as they looked at all the tributes that had been left. They had lost their granny. The Prince of Wales, the new Prince of Wales, he's issued that very moving statement talking about how he has lost a grandmother. And just there, again, as the coffin was taken inside, we had that, just that flash, that momentary shot where we remember that there are children and grandchildren who have lost someone very dear to them, just as the nation says goodbye to the longest reigning monarch in its history.
And Robert Lacey, who's been with me here throughout the day, you have studied history, you write about royal history, but we have not seen these scenes before and we may not again. Well, we certainly haven't seen them before. And uh, I think uh, maybe what's totally unique about today is hundreds of miles of clapping. Has ever that happened yes. before? Um, starting, as Sean said, with the, the small, humble church and finishing now in the grandeur of Edinburgh. But it, it, it was thanks to the helicopter, which had to break, take a break halfway through. Um, that's what's unique. Um, um, as we remarked earlier, um, uh, other um, monarchs have died away from the capital. Reminders of the United Kingdom we live in. Um, as the generations have gone by, they've been from Queen Victoria, who was just whisked up by train and taken to Windsor to um, uh, George the Fifth and George the Sixth, who came from Sandringham with with more ceremony and public attention, but this, this um, moves beyond them all. Every camera shot we saw, where we saw two images, what the camera was showing us and what all those upheld mobile phone screens were showing us too, which were in fact people's memories getting preserved that they will be taking home and looking at tonight. Um, uh, new technology bringing in this, the, the, these eternal emotions, an old-fashioned ceremony um, and meaning home in a new way. Yes, and what were, what were people clapping? Were they saying thank you? Were they saying goodbye? Were they, as we've heard so many times, that even all the people we've interviewed at Buckingham Palace today wanting to be part of this moment of history, as, as you've said, Robert? Mm. Well, we wondered with Martin, didn't we, what, how people would react with, with, the, with, the, with the conflicting emotions of farewell and then also the welcoming of, of the new era. Yes. Um, Old-fashioned English clapping. Sorry, <laughs> British clapping. British. Scottish clapping. Well done.